Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is March 27, 1977, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 22. Few things are certain in life, but one thing we can depend upon is that things are always changing. Today a flower blooms in all its glory. Tomorrow it will be withered and forgotten, leaving behind only a beautiful memory. Today a child at play scrapes a knee, and the whole world revolves around a mother's tender care. Tomorrow the knee will be healed, leaving behind only a lesson of caution and comfort. Today you and I pass through this world for a little while. Tomorrow we will not be seen, leaving behind only the legacy of our choices for good or evil. Last month, in AUDIO LETTER No. 21, I alerted you to the possibility that we may have already failed in our efforts to prevent NUCLEAR WAR ONE, which is drawing closer by the day. My question is not, can the war be stopped, but will it be stopped? There is nothing in this whole world that would please me so much as to be able to tell you Good news! We have prevented the war. We have won. And when I recorded Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 16 on September 25, 1976, it seemed as though I might soon be able to give you such good news. Public reaction to my AUDIO LETTERS No. 14 and 15 for July and August 1976 had thwarted an attempted Soviet double-cross of the Rockefellers by means of underwater missiles along our coastlines, and it had produced a direct meeting between General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and myself. But then came the terrible reversals for America that I revealed the following month in AUDIO LETTER No. 17, and far too many of those who had pressed the Government for action during August 1976, failed to follow through and support General Brown in his efforts to continue to protect our beloved country. Now as a result, we have lost General Brown as an effective force for good. Now the job of stopping NUCLEAR WAR ONE is even harder. It can still be done, but will we do it? My deep hope is still that the answer is yes, otherwise I would not be speaking these words. I am doing all in my power to bring the truth to you, so long as I continue to have access to vital information that bears on your life and your well-being, I will feel a deep responsibility to communicate it to you, but then it becomes your responsibility to choose what you will do about it. I have made many suggestions of things you might do to help save our country. In December 1975 I even recorded an entire tape devoted to nothing else entitled What We Can Do to Save America. But all I can hope to do is open your mind as to what you as an individual can do. In this great nation of some 215 million individuals, every person is different. No two of us have the same set of abilities, the same opportunities, or the same avenues for possible action. There is no way that I, just one person, even with the help of my associates and information sources, can provide a simple cut-and-dried prescription for what to do. But I am convinced that scattered throughout America is all of the knowledge, all of the ability to organize, and all the resources necessary to save our beloved land if we will but do it. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, How Circumstances Are Proving the Rockefeller Soviet Plans to Destroy America. Topic No. 2. President Carter's Efforts to Hurry Up Nuclear War One, And Topic No. 3. How the Church 
is being used. Topic No. 1 For over four years now I've been trying by every means at my disposal to alert the American people to the progress of far advanced plans to destroy our beloved country as we know it. We are seeing the final stages of a plan to create a worldwide dictatorship acted out before our very eyes with ourselves ensnared as the victims. This commitment for a one-world government under the control of a super-wealthy elite was set in motion in the early years of the 20th century using a small group of powerful tax-exempt foundations to coordinate and direct the program. This program of conquest long ago became so massive, so powerful, and so complex that the average citizen had no hope of grasping what was really going on, and the One World plans were and are so evil that the normal person simply cannot believe they are real without overwhelming proof. But how are things like this proven? Such a long-range commitment is a sophisticated form of conspiracy. So how are conspiracies exposed and proven? Well known in legal circles and especially in the United States Department of Justice are the words of Special Judge Advocate John A. Bingham during the trial of the conspirators involved in Abraham Lincoln's assassination. This trial took place in Washington, D.C. in 1865. Listen to Judge Bingham's words, and I quote, A conspiracy is rarely, if ever, proven by positive testimony. When a crime of high magnitude is about to be perpetrated by a combination of individuals, they do not act openly but covertly and secretly. The purpose formed is known only to those who enter into it. Unless one of the conspirators betray his companions and give evidence against them, their guilt can be proved only by circumstantial evidence. It is said by some writers on evidence that circumstances are stronger than positive proof. A witness swearing positively, it is said, may misapprehend the facts or swear falsely, but that circumstances cannot lie." Unquote. Judge Bingham's words may come as a surprise to you if you are not a lawyer. Contrary to the impression you may have received from fictional detective stories, circumstantial evidence can be very powerful indeed and has decided the outcome of vast numbers of court cases. Furthermore, it is the incriminating power of circumstances that makes any conspiracy most vulnerable to just one thing, exposure. If the plans of even the most powerful of conspirators are made public and put on record before the plans are executed, often the plans have to be abandoned. Because even if the conspirators succeed in carrying out their plans without being caught in the act, the circumstances that result from their criminal actions cannot be hidden, and the advance exposure of their plan then causes the finger of guilt to point straight at the conspirators. This is the principle I invoke every time I publicly reveal anything about the plans or actions of those who are conspiring to destroy America. As I have always tried to make clear, my purpose in exposing these criminal plans is to prevent them from being carried out. In this way I share a common goal with my associates and the many sources who provide me with vital confidential information. The best achievements of intelligence gathering, like diplomacy, often line what did not happen. The crisis quietly deflected and our efforts up to now have been partially successful in that regard. But the commitment for world domination that was forged over two generations ago has grown into an incredible monster with countless tentacles and tremendous momentum. As a result, the four Rockefeller brothers and their co-conspirators have found it impossible to completely cover their tracks 
even though many modifications in their detailed plans have been made. So a brief review of the circumstances that have been developing around us over the past years is very, very revealing. First consider Nelson Rockefeller's unsuccessful attempt so far to become our unelected President and Dictator by way of his 25th Amendment to the United States Constitution. On October 11, 1974, I recorded my first audio book talking tape entitled How to Protect Yourself During the Coming Depression and Third World War. At that time Rockefeller still had two months to go being confirmed as Vice President, but I revealed that if confirmed Rockefeller intended to become President by June 1975. In June 1975, during a trip to Europe, President Ford suddenly began taking serious falls, once down an aircraft ramp, and persons close to him said he also looked pale and unsteady. The public was quickly fed stories about the trouble being an old knee injury from football, even though Ford's doctor stated flatly that his falls had nothing to do with his knees. The following month in AUDIO LETTER No. 2 I relayed information I had been given to the effect that Ford's troubles had been caused by a powerful virus of unknown origin which had been arrested successfully. The next month I revealed in lectures and also in AUDIOBOOK SPECIAL TAPE No. 1 that by September or thereabouts we should know whether Nelson Rockefeller was to be stopped in his drive to seize the Presidency, and on September 5, 1975, an alleged attempt on Ford's life was made by Lynette Fromm, but as I warned in AUDIO LETTER No. 4 that month, this was only a dress rehearsal intended to frighten Ford into resigning. But Ford refused to resign, and on September 22, 1975, a real attempt on Ford's life took place. During a visit to San Francisco, Ford became the target of Sarah Jane Moore and it truly was only by the grace of God that he escaped injury. It had been planned for Ford when he came out of the St. Francis Hotel to cross the street and shake hands with people in the crowd, and there waited Sarah Jane Moore, standing exactly where Ford was supposed to enter the crowd, armed with a pistol she had bought with a Treasury agent by her side the previous day and with her mind programmed for assassination by electronic programming techniques. But at the last moment the assassination plan fell apart. A Secret Service agent told the President not to cross the street, so he headed straight for his limousine. At that Sarah J. Moore raised her gun to fire across the street of Ford, but her shot was deflected by another onlooker, a Vietnam veteran in a wheelchair. As it turned out, this was indeed the real turning point in Nelson Rockefeller's hopes for succeeding Jerry Ford as President. He ran through a series of additional backup plans, all of which my sources enabled me to reveal in advance in my monthly AUDIO LETTERS, and he failed for the time being. But he recently whispered to reporters as he left a White House awards ceremony, I'll be back. And then there is Fort Knox. I recorded my first AUDIO BOOK TAPE in October 1974, less than three weeks after the so-called Gold Inspection visit to Fort Knox by six Congressmen, a Senator, and about a hundred newsmen. Here was a perfect example of a case in which the true circumstances alone, namely the absence of the huge hoard of gold, shown on Treasury and Federal Reserve books would have been sufficient all by themselves to prove the existence of a tremendous financial conspiracy. Therefore great care was taken by the Treasury Department to prevent these circumstances from being detected. Instead of an objective, honest inspection of the bullion depository at Fort Knox by independent gold experts, the Treasury substituted a public relations peep show involving people who had no way of knowing what they should look for. And while the public was loudly promised an independent audit by the General Accounting Office of Congress, the actual so-called Audit Committee consisted almost entirely of Treasury personnel, 
and the tiny audit report that was finally issued several months late presented no findings of fact, concluding only, quote, we believe, unquote, that gold is there. My associates and I have amassed mountains of evidence in connection with the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. This twin scandal involves not only the theft of America's monetary gold supply, but also the storage of leaking canisters of CIA super poison processed from radioactive plutonium-239. From time to time I have made portions of this evidence public, such as in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 2 for July 1975. In that tape I was able to reveal the sworn statement of former Congressman Frank Shelf attesting to the constant flow of gold out of Fort Knox during the mid-60s and the unsatisfactory answers he received from the Treasury and the White House about what was going on. I also revealed that the official listing of gold shipments from Fort Knox omits major shipments. One example of which we had photographs took place on January 20, 1965, and in response to such a specific challenge, the Mint admitted the shipment had taken place. But the most important item about Fort Knox that was revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 2 was the secret Central Core Vault, a huge central gold storage vault whose existence was not revealed to the September 1974 visitors and was later denied in writing by then Treasury Secretary William Simon. Another interesting circumstance, because the Central Core Vault was described and confirmed for us and for Congressman Otis Pike by a former commanding officer of Fort Knox, General John L. Ryan, Jr. Both Simon's lie and General Ryan's confirmation are quoted in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 8, January 1976. The Central Core Vault is the key to the whole Fort Knox scandal. The joint Rockefeller-Soviet program to conquer the world is so all-encompassing that many other aspects of it have been discussed too in the monthly AUDIO LETTER. But the most overriding issue of all now is the rapid approach of NUCLEAR WAR ONE on American soil. In my very first tape recorded in October 1974, I explained the basic purposes for which the Rockefeller Brothers were betraying America into nuclear war. I also revealed the target schedule for the war to begin mid-1977 to mid-1978. Today some of the details of the war plan have changed, and the economic and political scenarios being planned by the Rockefellers at that time, while still on track, are behind schedule. But of all Rockefeller plans, the one for nuclear war on America is most crucial, and as of now the time schedule for war is still practically unchanged. For reasons I will explain in Topic No. 2, the Rockefeller Brothers are straining all their resources to prevent a slippage in the timing of the war. In July 1975, Indira Gandhi clamped down on her own India in a manner that stunned the world. She was condemned most bitterly of all by the Government of the United States. The following month, in AUDIO LETTER No. 3, I told you what had actually happened in India. Despite all appearances, Indira Gandhi was trying to save India's freedom, not destroy it. What she had done was to smash a CIA project that had been underway for five years to take over India. In the same tape I went on to reveal that the joint Rockefeller plans for war were being revised on India's account. The plan for nuclear war on American soil was put back on a back burner until India could be taken over by war in Asia. The target date for India to be attacked under the revised war plan was March 1977, this month. I also told you, quote, the new plans do not involve hostilities on American soil as they stand right now. Keep in mind, though, that further changes can and probably will occur. In particular, should Indira Gandhi be toppled from power any time soon, it may well enable the CIA to put the original takeover plans back on track, and that would restore the original plan 
for war on the United States." Unquote. When I revealed these things 19 months ago, they probably seem remote and improbable to you, but by relaxing the emergency control she had imposed and holding election on March 21, six days ago, she lost. Tragically for not only India but America as well. Once again things are not what they seem to be. The CIA succeeded in toppling Indira Gandhi by subverting the free election she wanted for her people, and did so this very month, March 1977. This was the original target date for war on India in the plans I revealed 19 months ago, with India taken care of, neutralized for the moment. Nuclear War I on American soil no longer faces any delay on India's account. In Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 for November 1975, I revealed the grand strategy for the huge Asian war that was to precede nuclear war on America. It called for hostilities to begin in the Middle East with a severe provocation arranged to justify a limited nuclear strike from the Sinai Desert at Arab OPEC oil wells. This cut-off of oil supplies would cripple the heart of Europe and Africa, disable Japan, and force dictatorial measures such as gas rationing and other measures on the American people by executive orders, with all these being brought about more completely under the domination of the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance. But now India has been rendered easy prey for a complete takeover and has therefore dropped in priority. The war in the Middle East has been delayed several times. The most decisive failure in this regard occurred late in December 1975 when OPEC oil ministers were kidnapped in Vienna by terrorists in the pay of the CIA. Several were supposed to be killed, inflaming passions and leading to war, but the job was botched and they all escaped with their lives. This caused a tremendous slippage in the plans for war and conquest, and for bungling this top priority assignment, the CIA Station Chief in Athens, Richard Welch, was executed by the CIA itself, as I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 8 for January 1976. In that same tape I publicly revealed the super-secret White House Merge Directive. This directive requires that life in the United States be so altered that it can be comfortably merged with life in the Soviet Union and it has been in existence since the days of Stalin. Such a way of life is totally alien to America, but today, under the puppetized administration of Jimmy Carter, the Federal Government is now openly run by aliens with alien philosophies. Our life is being merged with that of the Soviet Union. Even so, the greed and lust for power that motivates both the rulers of the Soviet Union and the real rulers of America today know no bounds. And as early as November 1975 in AUDIO LETTER No. 6, I began warning of the threat of a Soviet double-cross of the Rockefellers and their corporate socialist intimates here in America. By the spring of 1976 I reported that certain trustees of the Rockefeller-controlled major foundations were increasingly concerned that such a double-cross was brewing. But not so the Rockefeller Brothers and their closest collaborators, because they have more faith in the Soviet Union than they do in America. Last summer, of course, the Soviet double-cross actually began. First, as I reported in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 13 for June 1976, I received intelligence information that a nuclear weapon had been planted at Seal Harbor, Maine, between the summer homes of David and Nelson Rockefeller. Soon afterwards I was notified that the Soviet Union was planting short-range nuclear missiles within our own territorial waters, ready for launch from undersea resting places upon remote control. We were in danger of an immediate Soviet nuclear surprise attack, not only here but worldwide that would destroy all effective naval opposition to the Soviet Union and thereby guarantee Soviet victory. 
Thanks to the intelligence gap created by Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State, the information reaching me about the missiles was not reaching the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Intelligence sources informed me that the only way action could be brought about to save the situation was by making it a public issue, so that is what I did by means of AUDIO LETTERS 14 and 15 last summer, and it worked, as I recounted for you in AUDIO LETTER No. 16 for September 1976. But the four Rockefeller brothers long ago passed the point of no return. In spite of what has happened last summer, they are continuing with a joint program of conquest with the Soviet Union, trying to convince themselves that their long-time alliance is back on track, but at the same time they are trying to hurry up Nuclear War I, because in the Soviet Rockefeller rivalry time is now on the side of the Soviets. My friends, we are now surrounded by circumstances that prove the existence of a grand conspiracy to rob us of our freedom and even our very lives. It is up to each one of us to open our eyes and see these circumstances for what they really are before it is too late. Topic No. 2 Last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 21 I explained what the words national security really mean to those who control America's government today. To them, national security begins and ends with the protection and the advancement of our unelected rulers themselves, not you and me. Nowhere is this more vividly proven than in the realm of war. We are taxed to the breaking point in order to support so-called national security. But when in this century has all of this prevented a war? And for all our vaunted intelligence gathering and early warning systems, when have you and I ever benefited by being warned in advance of an imminent conflict by the government? It has been proven beyond question, not only by circumstantial evidence, but by documentary evidence as well, that every single major conflict in the 20th century involving America has been known about in advance by our rulers. But this advanced knowledge has never been communicated to us, the nation at large, except once. In 1962 President John F. Kennedy did notify America of the warnings he had obtained of the imminent Cuban missile threat. It was a frightening experience for us all, but the result was that a successful Soviet surprise attack was rendered impossible. Barely a year later Jack Kennedy died at the hands of the CIA for ruining this Rockefeller Soviet gamble by acting in the interest of true national security, our security. But in the cases of two world wars, Korea and Vietnam, a different pattern has consistently applied. In 1916 Woodrow Wilson the first American President to be a total puppet of the Rockefeller Empire narrowly achieved re-election with the peace-oriented slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. Meanwhile he was rapidly maneuvering America into war. Five months after his re-election on April 6, 1917, America declared war on Germany, and soon American Doe boys were off to fight the war to end all wars. There thousands died in trenches while trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace encouraged Wilson to extend the war because of the desirable changes it was producing in American lives. In 1940, with Europe once again aflame with war, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, like Wilson before him, appealed to peace sentiment in order to be re-elected. Even now, my friends, I can still hear those campaign words of FDR ringing in my ears. And I quote, And while I am talking to you mothers and fathers, I give you one more assurance. I have said this before, but I shall say it again and again and again. 
your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars." Unquote. But even as he won an unprecedented third term in this way, FDR was moving the United States rapidly toward war. On May 27, 1941, only six months after his re-election, and with Pearl Harbor still six months in the future, FDR proclaimed an unlimited national emergency to get ready for war. In the ensuing months everything possible was done to provoke a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and when this attack was known to be imminent, most of the United States Pacific Fleet was conveniently bottled up in Pearl Harbor as a tempting target. Only our aircraft carriers were kept far away from danger, since they would be indispensable for retaliation against Japan. Certain officials in the American Government knew well in advance that war with Japan was coming. Proof of this can be found in many places today, some of them quite unexpected. One example is the autobiography of the Right Rev. Edward Randolph Wells II published by Learning Incorporated, Manset, Maine, 04656. The book, entitled The Happy Disciple, is not basically about politics or economics at all, but about the career and life of an Episcopal minister. But it so happens that in the fall of 1941 Bishop Wells was the rector of Christ Church in Alexandria, Virginia, the Church of George Washington. And on page 62 one reads the following, and I quote, Another of my friends was Norman H. Davis, President of the American Red Cross, who was elected to our parish vestry. He was very close to President Franklin D. Roosevelt and saw him frequently. On November 6, 1941, I had lunch with Mr. Davis in Washington and learned of the approaching war with Japan which would begin within five weeks. I was shaken and asked Mr. Davis to urge the President to appoint a National Day of Prayer, and handed Mr. Davis a letter I had written to President Roosevelt on the subject. Mr. Davis did hand my letter to the President, who did appoint the following New Year's Day as a National Day of Prayer. I was so moved by the luncheon revelations that later that very day I sent our mimeograph postal cards to the congregation stating, The Rector is preaching a sermon at 11 a.m. service on Sunday, November 9, which he feels is sufficiently important to call to your attention. The sermon will assess the desperate situation that confronts America this armistice day and suggests basic Christian attitudes and actions. On Sunday in the course of that sermon I said, Few people realize how great is the possibility that we shall actually be at war with Japan within 30 days. The congregation was deeply shocked, and in response to many requests my booklet of sermons was reprinted with this sermon added. Twenty-eight days after that sermon came December the 7th the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and the war was on." End of quotation from Bishop Wells' autobiography. Bishop Wells, of course, had no way of knowing that President Roosevelt's advanced knowledge of the impending Japanese attack was due to conspiracy to bring about that attack, but he did know that people should be warned about it, and he did just that. The Federal Government, of course, could have warned all of America of the impending Japanese attack, but then the attack would never have taken place, and FDR, doing the bidding of the Rockefellers and their allies, wanted the attack to take place so that America would go to war. In the two-volume audio book talking tape I recorded a year ago with Colonel Curtis B. Dow. The detailed story of Pearl Harbor is told by Colonel Dow, and Colonel Dow, who was the son-in-law and close friend of FDR, knows what he is talking about. Next came Korea. On June 21, 1950, Assistant Secretary of State Dean Rusk 
testified before Congress to the effect that there was no indication of any impending North Korean attack on South Korea. Several days later John Foster Dulles went to Seoul, South Korea to give reassurances that there was no danger invasion from the North. Then he left quickly because the North Korean invasion was already being launched. As for us, the American people, another nasty surprise. Vietnam, too, followed the old pattern. The last thing the American people wanted was yet another bloody war, and during the election campaign of 1964 Lyndon Johnson knocked down straw man Barry Goldwater by playing on the peace theme. Goldwater was portrayed as the dangerous man who would get America into a big war, Johnson as the great compromiser who would keep us away from any such danger. But Johnson had already obtained the Tonkin Gulf Resolution as the tool he needed, and within three months after his landslide election Johnson started turning Vietnam into another big, disastrous war. By June 1965 the commitment of American combat troops to the nightmare of Vietnam had begun under the orders of one more President who had promised America peace and prosperity. Today it is all happening again. Jimmy Carter, the puppetized President who works for David Rockefeller, is raising many Americans' hope that this time it will be different. This time we have a President who wears sweaters and blue jeans and must therefore be a man of the people. He must be determined to have peace since he is so aggressively seeking disarmament, and he has promised us all that he will never lie. Yet in the short space of only two months President Carter has succeeded in alienating and angering governments the world over. Under the guise of folksiness he is systematically insulting visiting ambassadors with undignified receptions and by refusing to attend luncheons given by the ambassadors. He is preaching to the world about human rights while doing nothing whatever about the violation of our own human right to breathe clean air free of contamination by Soviet plutonium attacks, among other things. In the case of the Soviet Union, with whom he says he wants to negotiate arms reduction to prevent war, he is breaching an agreement not to interfere in one another's internal affairs that was signed by President Nixon back in 1972. He says he wants peace, but the circumstances he is bringing about with great speed are exactly those that could well lead to war. The fact is, my friends, that Jimmy Carter is sweeping us along swiftly toward Nuclear War I and the sooner the better, according to his Rockefeller bosses. Does he himself know where he has taken America by following orders? Bear in mind that he is conspicuously trying to emulate FDR in every respect, right down to launching his campaign last summer where FDR did in 1932, Warm Springs, Georgia, and reviving the fireside chat as President. And listen to Carter's own words from a recent fireside chat, and I quote, I remember another difficult time in our nation's history when we felt a different spirit. During World War II we faced a terrible crisis, but the challenge of fighting against Fascism drew us together. I believe we are ready for that same spirit again." Unquote. The Rockefeller brothers want very badly to have Nuclear War I begin as soon as possible for several reasons. The military balance is shifting ever more rapidly in favor of the Soviet Union and away from the Rockefellers even in the realm of secret superweapons. As of now, according to all the information I have been able to obtain, the CIA undersea super missiles in the Atlantic and Pacific which I revealed two months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 20 are still the most awesome nuclear missiles in the world. But as I revealed then, these CIA missiles, which are to protect the Rockefellers, not you and me, 
have become inoperative in several cases, and there is no way to predict how long those that remain will last before they too fail and start leaking. But there is another, even more basic worry the Rockefellers must think about. As of now the United States has no anti-missile weapons at all, and the Soviet Union has only the Galosh ABM, whose effectiveness against ICBMs is questionable. But that situation is on the verge of changing drastically very soon. Major General George Keegan, Jr., who retired on January 1, 1977 as head of Air Force Intelligence, is a man who has repeatedly been first to detect major new developments bearing on the military balance. He has said recently, quote, a global conflict is in gestation, unquote, and, my friends, he is right. Furthermore, he has been sounding the warning that the Soviet Union is already testing a death ray type weapon called a particle beam. Once this weapon is operationally deployed, in the very near future it could destroy incoming missiles and render the Soviet Union invulnerable to any ICBM attack, including an attack by means of the Rockefeller CIA undersea super missiles. Meanwhile the Soviet Union is continuing right now in a relentless program of planting underwater missiles along the coastlines of the United States and other countries around the world. And in spite of the Red Friday Agreement of October 1, 1976, which I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 17, the Soviet Union is not honoring the nuclear safe zone in planting these missiles. The Rockefellers believe that the threat of their CIA undersea missiles will prevent the Soviet missiles inside the Nuclear Safe Zone from actually being launched in Nuclear War I, but that is strictly a gamble on their part, because the threat is there. During the latter part of this month I have been receiving reports from my own intelligence sources about the current status of the worldwide Soviet program of planning short-range underwater nuclear missiles. When I recorded Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 15 last August, I gave the coordinates for 64 missiles and bombs around the world, including 16 in American and Canadian waters. That was sufficient to give the Soviet Union the capability of a surprise knockout punch against all the naval power in the world opposing the Soviet Union. But now, thanks to the insane Red Friday policy of the Rockefellers, the situation has been allowed to become far worse. Now redundant targeting ensures that any such Soviet attack has a very high probability of success. And in addition to naval and other military targets close to the sea, Soviet underwater missiles are now being aimed as well at increasing numbers of non-military strategic targets. As of my latest tally, the Soviet Union has so far planted a total of 372 nuclear weapons, mostly missiles, but a few bombs in coastal waters of the world. Of these, nearly half, 158, are planted in American waters. This includes 130 around the mainland 48 states, 9 more around Alaska, 15 in Hawaiian waters and one each at Midway Island, Guam, Christmas Island, and the north approach to the Panama Canal. The Soviet Union is also preparing to be able to strike with additional plutonium cloud attacks against America. On March 1, America extended its territorial limits to 200 miles and Soviet submarines have moved out beyond this new limit, but now remote control canisters are being planted along our west coast within 3 to 5 miles of the coastline. So far 16 of these have been planted and more are on the way. There are 29 missiles around the British Isles and 11 in Canadian waters. Europe and the Mediterranean are currently surrounded by 46 Soviet underwater missiles. Ten of these are in the Mediterranean. Along the Atlantic and North Sea coast, Spain is targeted by one France by three, the Netherlands by five, and West Germany by six. 
Three Soviet missiles have been planted in Danish waters, seven near Norway, six near Sweden, and five near Finland. In addition, seven Soviet underwater missiles surround Iceland. These are ready to decimate NATO air bases there, enabling the new Soviet supersonic long-range backfire bomber in its naval version to interdict all our vital sea lanes across the North Atlantic. The rest of the pattern worldwide is first on the Pacific and Indian Oceans, Australia 7, New Zealand 6, New Guinea 4, Philippines 6, Indonesia 6, Malay Peninsula 2, Thailand 1, Burma 1, India 1, Taiwan 3, Red China 7, border between Red China and Vietnam 1, Japan heavily targeted 19, South Korea 8, around Southwest Asia, Africa and the Middle East, Caspian Sea coast of Iran 3, Persian Gulf coast of Iran in Saudi Arabia 5, in the Oman Gulf 1, target Iran, Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia 2, Black Sea coast of Turkey 1, Southern Africa 8, and along the coast of Latin America, Mexico 11, Guatemala 1, British Honduras 1, Honduras 1, Nicaragua 1, even though Nicaragua itself is being used for certain naval purposes by the Soviet Union. Costa Rica 3, Venezuela 4, including one in the Orinoco River, Chile 5, Argentina 1. The British possession of West Falkland near southern Argentina is also targeted by one Soviet missile, as is the island of Bermuda. The government of any country I have named may obtain the navigational coordinates of the threatening Soviet underwater missiles from me upon official request. Up to now only one government, that of Great Britain, has requested these latest coordinates, and I have gladly supplied them. Great Britain is quietly living up to her majestic name because alone of all the nations on earth the British Government is fending off the Soviet naval threat with grim determination. I do not think it would be in the best interest of the British people for me to tell you all of the measures being taken in this regard beyond the fact that the Soviet missiles are being removed from British waters. But I will tell you that the British are proving one very important fact up to now. Given the will to do so, the Soviet war threat can be staved off. For all their modern weaponry, the Soviets are not supermen except in comparison to the treasonous jellyfish who control America's government today. What is necessary is to recognize circumstances for what they really are, and then to summon the spirit and determination to do what must be done. And that, my friends, is exactly what the British are doing right now. Topic No. 3 A few days ago the Reverend Billy Graham was quoted in newspapers as saying he likes, quote, symbolic gestures made to the American people. Unquote, by President Carter. He expressed particular pleasure at the fact that Carter not only plans to go to Sunday school but even to teach there. But as for the substance of the new administration, Dr. Graham said it is just too early to assess that. Millions of Americans are placing their trust in Jimmy Carter, an untried newcomer to national politics mainly because of his Sunday School teacher image. In the rush, rush world of today, Jimmy Carter's highly visible piety almost seems like something out of the past. A hundred years ago the following words might have been written about him, and I quote, He became a regular attendant at the Erie Street Baptist Church, and vigorously did Jimmy give himself to his work. Jimmy was publicly baptized in the fall of 1854. Not long after, Jimmy was made clerk of the church, an unusual responsibility for a mere youth, and indicative of the impression of maturity and responsibility that he gave to others. Before many years passed, he was teaching one of the largest classes in the Sunday school. As a bright high school graduate, a faithful attendant, 
a most staid and responsible young man, Jimmy soon took a prominent part in all church activities. He threw himself into them with characteristic single-mindedness. As we have said, the church offered this unemotional youth an outlet, while it also offered his mother, brothers, and sisters the best part of what social life they enjoyed." Unquote. My friends, I did not just make up these words to fit Jimmy Carter. I have simply substituted the name Jimmy for the name John in excerpts from the biography of John D. Rockefeller, Sr. by Alan Nevins. The striking thing about John D. Rockefeller was that his vigorous church activities never throughout his entire career translated into fair, honest, or ethical dealings in business. And in a similar vein today, Jimmy Carter, whether he realizes it or not, is preaching good but doing evil. How far might some dictators, past and present, have gotten if they had eliminated church opposition by themselves going to church? It may be that Jimmy Carter is being misled and is not knowingly doing that which is evil, but either way, my friends, that is no excuse for the rest of us to blindly follow along like sheep to the slaughter. If we do so, history shows clearly what will happen. The end of the world came for the organized church in Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Within a few short years more than 20 million Russians met death at the hands of the Soviet Government. And while a struggling underground of believers has persisted to the present day, the Church as an organization that can influence events directly no longer exists. And it will not exist so long as Communism remains the official religion of the Soviet Union. In mainland China, too, the same thing happened when Mao Zedong took over. The Church in China was much smaller as a percentage of the population than it had been in Russia, but its fate was the same, the end of the world, aside from a struggling remnant of believers forced underground. After killing more than 60 million of his own people, Mao succeeded in turning Communist China into perhaps the most rigidly regimented society on earth, and David Rockefeller who made Jimmy Carter President and calls the shots now, has expressed strong approval of this state of affairs. For example, several years ago he said, and I quote, The social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in human history." Unquote. Now, my friends, if we allow it to happen, we are next. America and the whole Western world. The elaborate plan which I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 for November 1975 is being revised and updated for application in the present circumstances. Certain of my sources have expressed great concern to me recently that a provocation for war in the Middle East is now being established that will be unlike anything we have ever seen before. I repeat. The Rockefellers are increasingly desperate to get NUCLEAR WAR ONE underway before they lose what control they still have over events. To achieve that purpose, plans are being seriously considered which, if carried out, could instantly throw all three major religions of the Western world into turmoil in the course of igniting a Middle East conflict. My hope is that by warning you of the existence of such plans, I am making them too dangerous for the conspirators to carry out. But in case they are carried out, I hope that you will now be able to recognize it immediately when it happens. We must not allow ourselves to be tricked, stampeded, or neutralized, my friends. We have important work to do. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.